In the lecture of this morning, we're going to go over beamforming. And beamforming is this other technique of source reconstruction. Yesterday, we've, we've been dealing with, with the forward modeling and with the dipole fitting. Um, I've shown some equations. Today, I'm only going to show a single equation. And that, that's one, like, I'm, I'm going to show that one because I, I think it's relevant that you've seen it. But I would, what I will try to do is I will try to convey the methods of the beamformer and the way that it's implemented just by a pictorial representation. So I, I really hope that all of you can get it. Again, looking, looking back at the beginning of this week, we used the temporal aspects of the data at the channel level. Uh, and today, we're con going to continue with using the spatial aspects to interpret the data at the level of the cortex. Uh, and basically, the, qu the question that we're asking is, like, how did the brain get these red and blue blobs that you often see in, in publications? So how do we get from? from the channel level data to this nice representation of the data. We have um, the forward model. So we starting from the physiological sources uh, using the volume conductor, we can solve the forward model and we can make a model for the observed potential of the field. And that also means that given the observation that we have and using the forward model, we can try to estimate, we can try to infer the physiolo physiological sources underlying our data. If we use dipole fitting, what we do is we have a source that is projecting on the channels and we have a model for which we can also compute the data on the channels and we can fit the dipole around until it optimally matches. That's what we've seen yesterday. Yesterday we shortly touched on, on distributed dipole models where we have a source that projects on the channels but where we assume, well, we know where the, where the activity is coming from. It's coming from gray matter. So let's just put a whole bunch of dipoles in the gray matter. Let's estimate the strength of all the dipoles simultaneously. That's distributed source modeling. That's usually done using minimum norm estimates. And that's, that's why it's often called MNE. With spatial filtering, we're making a distributed representation of the activity, but we're only addressing a single dipole at a time. So for a given dipole, what's their strength? and then we move the dipole to another location. So it's a scanning method. And yesterday we already looked a little bit at scanning, but then scanning in the context of trying to find the optimal location. Now we're going to scan, and we're not going to look for the optimal location, we're going to look at the activity everywhere. It's not only about estimating the sources. So where are... Um, what are the location, but it's also about estimating these, these time courses. And that, that's also what, what Stephen already showed this morning. So on one hand, you have the position. On the other hand, you have the source, uh, source wave, uh, the, the activity of the source. And it's this activity of the source that we, uh, that we want to interpret. We want to know the timing of the sources. We want to know the connectivity between the sources. Um, so so this, is, this is really important that, you, that source reconstruction is more than just source localization. And an important concept that we're using here is superposition of source activity. So if we have one source, then we have a varying visibility of the source to each of the channels. And the time course of each source contributes to each channel. So the, 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 the contribution of each source depends on its visibility at a channel. But basically, they all add up. So if I have two sources, then one channel is just going to see activity of the two sources, depending on the visibility of the two sources. So we have a linear superposition. And this linear superposition of sources can be modeled like this. So we have data, which is the sum of a source times its lead field. Like how does a source, how is a source visible on the channel level? Plus the sum, of plus the, the, the product of a lead, of a second lead field times a second source, etc., etc. What we assumed so far with single and multiple dipole models is that we want to minimize the error between the model and the measured potential. So what we say, well, we assume that we have a small number of sources. What well, we say, well, <coughs> we want to make, we have, we have the data, we want to make a model for this. It's not explaining the noise. So if I now take the model of this, now if I subtract it from the data, then, well, the remaining thing is the noise. And um, what, what we want is we want the noise to be small, 
like we want to, we want we want the noise to be too small but not too small like we don't want to explain the noise and that's why we're not taking too many sources here and it's also difficult to find a position as we've seen yesterday but it's it, this is one of the methods in distributed dipole models what we're going to have is we're going to have so many sources that the remaining noise after fitting our model to the data is going to be zero and that's why we need additional constraints such as smoothness power or, or amplitude constraints the idea is that um, we have uh, again we have the same model for the data but now we assume n is typically very large like m many more than the number of channels um, so what we do is we make this model and then we multiply the data minus the noise minus the parts that we don't do not want to explain um, we multiply it with the inverse of the lead field matrix and that gives us the combined source strength for all the sources the, the idea with <coughs> spatial filtering is that we're computing the spatial filter at every location and subsequently we scan the whole brain and repeat the procedure at each of the grid locations and beamforming comes in a uh, sorry, sp spatial filtering come in a variety of approaches that all have different assumptions on the underlying data. And the one that I'm going to uh, explain most about is beamforming. And beamforming again comes in different versions. And uh, the terminology that we use a lot within FieldTrip is LCMV, Linear Constraint Minimum Variance Beamformer. That's the, in it, the original beamformer as it was introduced. Um, in uh, uh, 1779 by uh, Barry van Veen in a really important paper. And then later, um, modifications of this beamforming technique have been made using slightly different assumptions, such as synthetic aperture magnetometry um, and dynamic imaging of coherent sources. There is also another um, type of uh, spatial filtering techniques, which is often called music, multiple signal classification. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of music versions. There's rap music, and there's, I think there's also reggae. Um, <laughs> uh, and they're all, they're, they're all scanning techniques. Uh, and they're all like strategies of give an assumption on the data, scan the whole brain, and try to estimate the activity at various positions. The data model that we're using with scanning techniques, it's again, it's the same data model. So what we have is we have the data being explained by a whole bunch of sources plus some noise. But rather than focusing on all sources at the same time, we're only going to focus on a single source. So we're going to take <coughs> the activity, all the activity that is present in the data plus the noise, we're going to take that together and say, well, that's the not interesting part of the data. The only part of the data that I care about is H1 times S1. And I'm going to call the rest for the, f for the time being, I'm, I'm going to call that noise. Because it's, it's not the signal from the brain region that I'm interested in. And that's something that I can repeat for many different source locations. So if I'm at another source location, I'm just going to call H2 times S2, the, the signal of interest, and the rest is the noise. Of course, it's, it's not the noise, but it's the, it's the signal that I'm not interested in. And that's something that I repeat over and over again. We have seen that FieldTrip implements these functions, so I first want to point out a little bit like which functions are needed for, for the source modeling. So this is like the, o the total overview. No, it's, a, it's not a total overview. It's a, it's a small overview of some future func functions and how they fit together, like starting with uh, defined trial, pre-processing, time lock analysis, source analysis. And then we have source analysis. We have the dipole fitting. Yesterday, we've been working with the dipole fitting. Today, we're going to work with the FT source analysis function. So there's different algorithms on the mark. So several of these are implemented in FieldTrip. Um, and that's what you implement using either dipole fitting or source analysis with method is MNE for distributed source models, LCMV for time domain beamforming, or DICS for frequency domain beamforming. So that's how you call the functions. So both of these are, are beamforming techniques. And we have some, some other variants as well, but these are the, the ones you should care about most. So what is the procedure that we use for beamformers? And here I really want to take one step back. It's not only about that we already have the data, 
but already in the design of the experiment you sh should start thinking about how you want to analyze your data. So what you do, you design data, you measure your, br your brain activity, then you do the processing using defined trial reject artifact preprocessing, you do your uh, t time frequency, your time analysis or time frequency analysis and then you, we're going to do the source analysis where we prepare the necessary geometrical objects, we compute the forward model and then we compute the inverse estimate of the activity and the source positions. In designing the experiment, what, what is really recommendable is to include a baseline. For dipole fitting, that is not so important, we just explain the data given the model. With, with beam forming, what we'll, what we'll do, and uh, that's also something that we will address tomorrow, is we often want to make uh, contrast. We want to make statistical, con statistical contrast between conditions. And thereby it, re it really helps if you include a baseline condition where you also have clean data. Like not, not a baseline condition where you have the subject blinking, etc., where, where the subject is not yet attending. So what we do is we give the subject an explicit blink instruction and then the trial starts. And basically the trial starts with a window in which the subject is attentive but not yet doing the task. Then here, so this is, this is an experiment from a memory uh, paradigm. A, uh, uh, um, a, a queue is presented and the subject has to recall to which location this face was memorized. So the, the subject, in this example, the subject had been practicing the association between faces and places uh, the day before and we were interested in seeing memory consolidation. So we, what we do is we take around this, this stimulus, we're going to see what is, the, what is the brain activity just prior to the presentation of the stimulus and sh shortly after the presentation of the stimulus. This is where the subject is already attentive but not looking at anything and this is where the subject is trying to recall the place at, at to which this face associates. Subsequently we have a response and we want to keep that response out of the data that we're analyzing so that we have a clean contrast between the baseline and the activity of interest. The beamformer relies on a covariance matrix. I will explain that. Um, but that means that we want to have a, reli a reliable estimate of the covariance matrix. So we, have, we need to have sufficient length of a stationary signal. Um, and that is why often we try to make this part and this part like approximately equally long and we want to make sure that the movement related activity is not already leaking in here. So that's why in a lot of experiments we're actually quite keen on using a delayed response. Like the response is there to check that the subject has been doing the task correctly, but, but often we're not interested in analyzing the response. So let's, let's delay the response. And one of the methods that you can use is not uh, to give the subject the, instru the instruction to press either with its left or right hand so that the subject does not yet know when he is, or is, at which moment and with which hand he's going to make the response, which means that the subject cannot prepare for the response. And it's also important that we have to avoid artifacts, and that is why we have an explicit instruction at a certain point in the experiment to blink. So rather than, well, the subject has to blink anyway, so rather than having the subject blink during an experiment, we are rather having blink sh shortly before each trial. It's also important to make the experiment not too long or to induce breaks uh, because otherwise the subject will get fatigued, it will become uncomfortable and if a subject is fatigued or uncomfortable you're going to have more artifacts. So then we measure the brain activity and in order to do a proper statistical contrast between the experimental conditions it, it's important that, that it's not something trivial that explains the difference between the conditions. And that is why we always record EOG and ECG. We use it to, re to remove the artifacts, but you also can use it to see whether there's not a trivial difference, for example, in eye blinks in your experimental condition versus the baseline. We measure the sensors and the, posi the position of the sensors relative to the head. We try to reduce head movement in the MEG. Um, and then we make the anatomical scan for the head modeling. And this is, again, an important part. If possible, what we try to do in, uh, in a lot of our experiments, we try to include a localizer task. 
So rather than starting off and saying, well, I don't know where the brain activity is from, so let's scan the whole brain. If I have a localizer, if I have a functional part of, uh, uh, part of the experiment in which I can functionally localize a brain region, then in the subsequent analysis, I don't have to scan the whole brain anymore. I just look at the activity in the brain region that I've localized. And this is, this is used a lot in fMRI analysis, uh, and, and also in beamformer analysis we, we use it. And it's, it's really very valuable because it greatly increases your statistical sen sensitivity. Rather than having a multiple comparison problem all over the brain, you only look at the brain region that's interesting. And then we do the pre-processing, we segment the data, we uh, remove the artifacts, uh, we do the time frequency analysis, so we look at what's happening after stimulus onset, and then we select a time frequency window, and then we say, let's beam this tile, this time frequency window. So there's a stimulus component in here as well. So what we, what we can do is we, given this time frequency response, which we have identified at the channel level, we're going to specify, well, let, let's take a time window of one second. We have a frequency resolution of one hertz due to the rally frequency, like one divided by the length of the time window. And it means that we're going to have a bandwidth from 9.5 to 10.5. Because we're also going to have some, some spectral leakage. Um, but that's, that's what we control for using an appropriate taper. Um, and then we, <coughs> again, go back in the data and we cut out the single data window and we use MTM FFT usually to estimate the activity. And that's because with MTM FFT, it's easier to configure all of these parameters. And then we beam it. After having done the beam form of source reconstruction, we start looking at the, at the contrast. So in this case, it's a memory experiment that I, that I have here as an example. So we have recorded the subject twice, once when he was once when he, when he had just memorized all the stimulus material and the second time, like one day later, when he had slept over it for a night, and when, when he had consolidated all the stimulus material. So what we do is we can compute the contrast at the channel level, and at the channel level we can look at whether there's si significant dif differences in a specific time frequency tile. And there are. This is the time frequency tile. So rather than looking at this, these large components that we can see directly in, in the data, we can o at the channel level, we can already identify time window and a frequency window in which the interesting activity is happening, the activity that is different between the two experimental conditions. So this is again something that is important to realize. Like you can, you can try to ask all of your questions at the source level. You can, you can say, well, I don't know what's in the data, but let's first go to the source level and then try to localize it. If you're able to reduce your question into, well, let's try to estimate activity in my region of interest by using a localizer. Or if you're able to reduce your question further, let's identify the activity in this time frequency window in my region of interest. Then you're greatly increasing sensitivity to finding the effect that you're interested in or in being able to report on that effect. So that's what we then do is we, we beam this time frequency tile. Again, we, um, <coughs> we look, at the, look at the data. We see that the time window is about 200 milliseconds, that the width, spectral width of the effect is about 20 hertz. So what we, ha what we take is we take an 0.2 hertz, uh, sorry, an 0.2 second time window and that gives us an intrinsic resolution of 5 hertz. 1 divided by 0.2 is 5. But we want to have a time window, oh sorry, a, fre a frequency window that is 20 hertz wide. So rather than estimating this, we're using spectral smoothing. And that's where the multi-tapering comes in, which I explained yesterday. So we use multiple tapers to get the activity in this time frequency window. So to recapitulate, so we have multi-tapers, and more tapers for a given time window result in more smoothing, and we have multiple orthogonal tapers for, for the time window. And subsequently the power, but also the phase, is calculated for each taper data segment and subsequently combined. 
Um, so using multiple tapers allows us to analyze the same data window multiple times. So in terms of statistical power, you can imagine multi-tapers actually allowing to have multiple independent estimates within each trial. So what we're doing is we're increasing the de degrees of freedom in our estimation procedure. So if we take this time frequency window combined with five tapers, then this is the spectral bandwidth that we can get. And that's, that's actually nice because it nicely overlaps with our window. And then we beam the data in this time frequency tile. So it's, it's really about going back and forth between the data and the estimation procedure prior to doing the source reconstruction. So this is the, uh, the configuration that we use in FTFRAC analysis, uh, where we specify the time window and the top smofrook, the taper smoothing frequency, um, to get our spectral estimate. Important in FRAC analysis for beamforming is that we not only have the power, but that we also have the phase information. So by default, if we do FTFRAC analysis, you only get the power. If you want to do beamforming, what you have to specify, config output is PAU and CSD, power and cross-spectral density. That's going to result in the cross-spectral density also being present in here, and that's what the beamforming algorithm needs. So that's the modification that you need here. So the question with beamforming is, given the activity that we have at a certain source, <coughs> at a certain location, what is its activity? And we have the data, so what we can do is we can look at the data that we've recorded at the channel level, and we know that it's a linear superposition, so we know that a linear combination of the channels should be able to reconstruct the activity, the time course of the activity at this location. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the explanation of the beamformer in the time domain because it's, it's just easier uh, to conceptualize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you time courses rather than spectral content. But the whole formulation works exactly the same in the frequency domain. And what we're going to do in a hands-on session is that we're going to use the beamformer in, in the frequency domain rather than the time domain. We estimate the activity of the source, S, with a spatial filter, which is W. And the concept is, well, we divide the, brit, the, the brain into a grid, like many grid points, and at every location, we estimate the activity. And at every location, we have the source time series. What we then can do is we can make a statistical test where we look at the activity in the baseline versus the activity in the stimulus window, we make a uh, statistical contrast, and then we create a blob. And this is, for example, the result of a gamma band beam format activity after presenting a visual stimulus, and it localizes to visual cortex. And the type of analysis that we use here to get to these maps are really very SPM-like fMRI type of analysis. Of course, what we also can do, having the time series at the source level, we can look at connectivity. So we can compute the connectivity between each of the time series, and we can visualize, given a seed region, we can visualize the connectivity of that seed region to the rest of the brain. So we need a spatial filter. How do we compute a spatial filter? Well, we have the forward model, which predicts the data from a source of interest, uh, and it assures the specificity in space. So with the beam form, we're trying to zoom in on a certain location. And it's this forward model that allows us to zoom in on the location of interest. Then we have our experimental data. Um, the experimental data has, a, has an experimental contrast, active versus baseline. But the experimental data basically allows us to ensure selectivity for the effect of interest. So I'm not only zooming in, I'm actively trying to block out activity that I'm not interested in. So, the forward model, how is the source seen by the sensor array? And given a source look at location R, what is the data? So if we now look at the source model, sorry. So we have a source, and the source projects to the channels. If we now look at the source, this is what we start off with. A given source at a particular time point. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm plotting it as a vector. And I'm just plotting a vector here as a horizontal 
box. So given, so how, how is this computational? Well, basically what we have is we have the data, and the data is now many channels by many time points. It's again, it's a matrix. And what we have is we have a forward model. The forward model tells us how each of the, how this source projects onto the channels. This forward model is often called the lead field. So the data is equal to the lead field times the source strength. Yeah? And so I promise to only show you one equation. So this is not really an equation yet because it's like it's just a multiplication. This is, this is simple. <laughs> <laughs> but <coughs> please, please look, look at, the, uh, at what I'm going to do with the, with the matrices, okay? Um, so we, we, need, we need the sensor positions. Where, where's the brain relative to, this, to the sensors? Uh, um, and in the case of MEG, we need to have the position of the, of the head in the MEG helmet. Um, so what we have is we have the source model expressed to the relative sensors. Um, we have the helmet position is expressed in the grot structure, actually, or the position of the sensors relative to the head ex is expressed to the grot structure. So what we have, if, if you look in your data, wh what we have is we have frec.grot. Those are the gradiometers. Actually, with the, CTF, with the CTF system, it's gradiometers. With the Neuromax system, it's gradiometers. Uh, it's planar gradiometers, but also magnetometers. So we just happen to call it grot, but it's also magnetometers. And sometimes we refer to it as the sensors, like s where we call it sense. Um, we have the position of the potential sources, like which locations do we consider interesting uh, for our analysis. So if you have a region of interest, it's only a single source, but quite often we do want to scan the whole brain. So you can create one yourself by specifying config.grid is source model, but you can also have FieldTrip create one for you, where you just specify the resolution of the grid, and then you just get a regular grid. To have more fine-grained control of the grid that you want to scan, you can use the ft-prepare source model function. Um, then we have the volume conductor model. So what's the shape of the volume in which the, the, the volume currents are flowing? Um, which is specified in config.vol, and that's the head model, the, head, the volume conduction model of the head. That is one that you definitely have to create yourself. Um, using FT prepare head model. So that basically gives us all the ingredients that we need for the forward model, and then we combine these ingredients using FT prepare lead field to compute the lead fields for each of the source points which is the H matrix. And with the H matrix, we can uh, start addressing the question, wh what are the optimal filters? So we know how the source projects onto the channels. Um, when we now want to get the data from, from the source, so, so the, the, the we know how to get the data from the source to the data, uh, from, the, from, the, from the source to the channels, sorry. Uh, and we now want to go from the channels to the source. So we want to find what is this W that allows us to estimate the sources. And W, or W transposed, as I'm using it here, is, is a spatial filter. So let's again look at how, what we're doing. So we're taking, for each channel, we're determining a specific weight. And the, the time series of the channel times the weight, we add it up, we sum it up to get the time series of the source. What are the characteristics that we want the spatial filter to have? So what I'm showing here is along the horizontal axis, I'm showing space. And we have a source that is located somewhere in space, and we have <coughs> interfering sources. So in space, we want to zoom in on this particular region, and we want to block out interfering sources. So this is very similar to what I explained yesterday about spatial leak, uh, sorry, about spectral leakage in the frequency domain, where we want to estimate the power at a specific frequency band but not be affected by other frequency bands. So we want to have a spatial filter that is not sensitive to activity coming from any other sources. So the ideal spatial filter would look like this. However, in reality, we always are going to be sensitive to spatial leakage. So here it's not spectral leakage, but it's spatial leakage. And we can make a general filter, such as what we do with a, with a dipole fit, where we just use a linear inversion to estimate the source strength. 
of the, of the sources after having localized them. And the general filter will have a profile that looks like this, which means that over here, where we have an interfering source, it is not actively suppressing the interfering source. A general filter will allow to estimate the activity of a source, but not while simultaneously uh, uh, suppressing an interfering source. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a spatial filter that is not only sensitive for the source of interest, but also one that is going to actively suppress the interfering sources that are present in the data. So ideally we want to have a unit pass band. So for the source of interest, we want to fully see it. Um, and that's something that we, the well, unit pass band is easy to achieve. So if you look at space, then the ideal spatial filter would look like this. If this is where the source would be, this is the activity that it would pick up. And at another location, this is the activity that, that it would pick up. But in reality, we have a spatial filter that looks like this. So we have, at the location of interest, we are picking up activity. We're not necessarily insensitive to the activity elsewhere. And at another location, the spatial filter would look like this. So there is spatial leakage of interfering sources into the estimate of the region of interest. So the true source activity might be like this. The estimated source activity, we would like it to be, to be like this, but in reality it's going to be something like this, right? Because it's just blurred. And, and here we're not necessarily assuming that, there's, that the activity is at a single location. We're assuming that there can be activity everywhere, but we're estimating activity at one location at a time. So if this were the spatial filter, then we would be able to reconstruct the true source activity. But since this is the spatial filter, this is the reconstruction that we get. Although we can specify a unit passband, what you also want to do, therefore, is to minimize the beamformer output. So we want to have a spatial filter that's as tight as possible in explaining the data. So if you revisit the question, we want to go from the data from the channels to the source using W, using a spatial filter. And the data model that we have is Lichfield times the source equals the channel level data. So if I now take the channel level data and if I take the estimated source, how would I go about in trying to find the time course of the estimated source? Well, I want to multiply the data with a spatial filter. So the spatial filter times the data is the estimated source. And I can basically, I can take this part and I can plug it in here. Because this part is the data. At least it's my model for the data. So I'm going to plug this part in here. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to look at this one, and I'm going to look at this one. So rather than focusing here, I'm going to focus here. So W transpose times H times the true source is my estimated source. So what, we want, what do we want the spatial filter to do? Well, if we have a source at a given location, so at the purple location, we want W spatial filter times the lead field for that specific location, times the true source, we want it to, to give us our estimated source. And if we look at another, sorry, if, if we then look at this equation, what we can do is we can divide both sides by the source strength. And if these are close to each other, then basically the division results in one. So what we basically want is we want W times the lead field matrix should be one. And for another source, at the blue location, we want the same thing to happen. So we want to have W transposed for the blue location times the lead field for the blue location should also be 1. But what's also impo important is that if we're trying to estimate the activity at the purple source, we want the spatial filter for the purple source times the lead field for the blue source should be 0. Because we want to, in our estimate, we want to suppress the activity of an interfering source. Yeah? And of course, this also applies to other sources. Like, uh, so for example, the green one, we also want to simultaneously suppress the, the green one. And basically, we also want to suppress activity that's present in the data for which we don't even know where it comes from. So what we do is we zoom in on a region of interest, blocking out all other activity. <coughs> 
there's two um, constraints that were that are now that I have now defined. So the first one is that W transpose times H should be one, and that's a unit gain constraint. And the other one is that W transposed for one source times the lead field of another source should be one, uh, sorry, should be zero. And this can in general not be fulfilled. So rather than making this zero, what we're going to do is we're going to make it as small as possible. So we're going to compute a filter that minimizes the variance. So let's look at this in more detail. So what we have is the, uh, we have the lead field, sorry, we have the spatial filter times the data is our source. And if we look at the, active, at the variance of the source, if we look at the power that is contained within the source, it's, well, it's basically it's the, it's the variance of the um, variance is just the time series of the source times the time series transposed. It's just the sum of the squared elements of this vector. I, I should divide by n, but this, this is good enough for now. So if you now look at this part, I can basically plug it in here, so th because this is the source strength, which also means that I can plug it in here. I have to transpose it. So what I have here is W transpose times X times X transpose times W. And rather than looking at the sources now, I'm going to look at the central part. So what I have here is the data times the data transposed. And that's the data covariance matrix. So it's not the noise covariance matrix, but it's really the, it's the data covariance matrix. And this data covariance matrix allows us to minimize the variance using this equation. This is the equation that I was alluding to. This is the solution for the spatial filter. And this, what you see is that the spatial filter W transposed has as ingredients the lead field matrix. And the lead field matrix happens one, two, three times. And it has as an ingredient the data covariance matrix twice. So what if we're computing a beamformer, spatial filter, then we're basically we're computing this equation. We have the forward model. Um, we have a lead field for each source, given the forward model. We have the experimental data. And in the time domain, we use the data covariance matrix, as I just showed. In the frequency domain, we use something that's very similar, but it's called the cross-spectral density matrix. And the cross-spectral density matrix is basically it's the covariance matrix at a specific frequency. This is how the co covariance matrix of the data might look like. So what you see is that there's a lot of a uh, high covariance of the channels with themselves, and the further away the channel, the lower the covariances be, uh, will, will be. Although some channels further away also have a, have a high co uh, covariance because they're picking up both sides of the same dipole, for example. <coughs> we have the radiometer positions. Um, and then we specify FD source analysis where we have the source model, the head model, uh, sorry, and we have this frac structure, and it's this frac structure that contains the cross-spectral density matrix. So that's how we put everything together. The strength of a beamformer is that it's easy to average over subjects. So what we're doing, we're scanning the whole brain, and we use a grid, and of course, within every subject, we can use the same grid. So we can just consider the, like, the whole brain as a region of interest, and we just scan the whole brain. And that means that if we have two subjects, and one subject has three sources that are active, and another, uh, the second subject has two sources that are active, we can still, with, with, with dipole methods, we would have a difficult time to figure out, like, how do we com compare these sources? Like, is this one, is that the same one as this one, is it, or is this one the same as this one? It's like, this, this one seems to be consistent. So with dipole fitting, it's, it's much more difficult to compare data over subjects and to take the variability over subjects into account. With beamforming, what we do is we just estimate ev activity everywhere. And that means that beamforming gives us reconstructions that are suitable for SPM-like statistics. And the reason for this is that beamforming is a spatial filtering technique. And the estimate that you get at every position is independent from the estimates that you're computing at all the other positions. Because we have spatial leakage. So the estimates are not, the spatial filters are not extremely sharp. But at least the scanning procedure allows us to compute activity wherever we want, either location of interest or in the whole brain. 
there's no a priori assumptions about uh, the amount of sources, uh, or so th and there's no a priori assumption about the location of the sources. And most often beamforming uses, <coughs> most often beamforming is more spatially focal than distributed minimum norm source solutions. With distributed uh, source models, what we assume is that there's distributed activity everywhere, whereas with beamforming, we're not making this assumption. So beamforming often gives more focal source reconstructions. However, what we've done is we've made an assumption about the data. And that assumption about the data is that the sources should not be too strongly correlated in their time series. And this is a simulation where we have a slice of the head, basically cut like this. And two sources were put in. Here they are very close by, and here the sources are very far apart. So here it would be like, for example, motor activity and sensory activity, and here it would be auditory activity in one, and then the other auditory cortex. If the sources in this simulation, if they're uncorrelated, and if we reconstruct the activity using the beamformer formulation, then this is the pattern of activity that we're getting. So what you see is that here you can clearly dissociate two peaks in a beamformer source reconstruction. And here you can also clearly dissociate two peaks. And what we can do is we can increase the amount of correlation between the sources. If they are mild, mildly correlated, what you see is that the two peaks are going to blur together. Here, it already becomes difficult to distinguish them. But if the peaks are far apart, then you can still see them. But if you, if you have perfectly correlated sources, this is what the beamformer will do. So what you're going to get is a, a single peak, regardless of whether the sources are close by or whether the sources are far apart from each other. So this is the situation that we, that we have if we're trying to beamform auditory evoked fields. The auditory evoked fields in both auditory cortices are highly correlated, like the timing in an auditory cortex is very precisely linked, um, which means that we're going to localize the activity towards the center of the head. The question, like, what, what a question that you could ask, like, is, is this not a problem then? Well, yeah, yes, it is. But it, it's not a necessary a problem for all experimental data that we have. We know that the beamforming will fail if sources are strongly correlated. But in many cases, the sources in the brain are actually not that strongly correlated. So probably in quite a lot of the activity, oh, sorry, not the direction, we will be probably be more or less in this domain, where if the sources are close by, we might not be able to separate them. But if the sources are far apart from each other, we can separate them. And of course, whether this applies or whether this applies depends on the data. And that's, uh, that's always a difficult, difficult aspect. Like We don't know what's in the data, but we have to make assumptions. And with the beamform, we can easily make this assumption. We can, we can try this out. What I also said is we're often we're contrasting experimental conditions. And it's in this contrasting of experimental conditions that we are relying on, on, the, on the properties of the data. So what we have is we have, for example, in this uh, example, we have three experimental conditions. And each of the experimental conditions gives us a covariance matrix or a cross spectral density matrix. So what we in principle could do is we could estimate the activity in each of the conditions separately, given that we have one lead field for grid locations. And we can have multiple data sets, for example, <coughs> conditions of files. But if we try to estimate the, the activity of each of the conditions separately, then we are going to get spatial filters that have different spatial leakage profiles, which means that the spatial leakage in one condition might be different than the spatial leakage in another condition. And if we're then going to contrast the conditions, well, we're going to see a difference. But that difference might actually not be different due to the sources being different. It might be due to the spatial leakage being different. So that's why, so this is a, a depiction of the spatial filters. So the solution for the beamformer is a, is a unique, unique spatial filter for each subject and for a specific data set. And what we're going to do if we have multiple conditions is that we're going to pool the conditions. So we're going to take data set A, condition A, data set B, and we're going to pool them together. And using the pooled data, we're computing a common filter. 
because if we have a common filter, then we know that the spatial leakage is going to be common in both of the conditions. And that means that if we apply the common filter to each of the individual data sets, then we know that the difference that we find in the common filter applied to each of the data sets is not due to different spatial leakage, but must be due to different underlying source activity. This is basically how we do it. So we have, uh, again, we are using FT source analysis. Um, but if we want to compute common spatial filters, we're going to use the option config.keepfilter is yes. Normally what, SP, uh, what FT source analysis will return to you is only the source time series or only the source power. But if you specify keep filter is yes, it's, only, it's also going to return the spatial filters. And then we can use this, those spatial filters. <coughs> so we're going to, we, we do typically do two analysis. In the first analysis, we focus on, on the computation of the spatial filters. And in the second analysis, we apply the spatial filters to one of the two experimental conditions. So to summarize, Beamforming is a scanning method. We scan the whole brain, uh, and each, at each point we do an independent estimate of the spatial filter, an independent estimate of the time series. Um, inverse modeling by a spatial, spatial filter unifies two constraints, and the unit gain constraint is to pass all activity at the location of interest, while the second constraint, the minimum variance constraint, is to suppress as much activity th as possible. And the activity that we're suppressing is basically obtained from the data. So we're not explicitly saying which activity we want to suppress, because we know that all the activity that was recorded and that's not coming from the location of interest is interfering. That's why we do why we suppress all the activity that's present in the data not coming from this region of interest. And that makes use of the data covariance matrix. And <coughs> beamforming methods are both possible in a time and in the frequency domain. Um, I've shown you how the time domain beamformer works, uh, but the frequency domain beamformer is conceptually it's, it's very similar. Uh, there's no a priori assumptions on the sources, um, except that we assume that we can explain the data with a single, uh, uh, that for a region of interest that a single equivalent current dipole is able to explain the activity at the cortical patch. If there are two cortical regions that are strongly correlated, we can make other assumptions. So for example, with the beam forming method, we can also assume that we have symmetric dipoles as the source models, which actually means that we can again scan with a symmetric dipole pair. So those are the tricks that we can use to make the beam former also work in cases where there's a lot of correlation between the sources. But that's like more for advanced beamformer users. And beamformers are applicable in many scenarios, except when you have good reasons to expect strongly correlated source. Then you have to start using tricks such as symmetric dipole scanning, etc. Any questions? So what we have is we have a filter times the data. And on this slide I'm explaining how the filter is computed by minimizing the variance. <coughs> so what we have is we have, this is the data covariance matrix. And given this data covariance matrix, we have the variance of a source. And the variance of a source is the power of a source. So quite often, if we're not, not yet interested specifically in the temporal aspect of the source, we're just going to look how strong is the source. What is its variance? So what we do is we, for a given location, we compute the spatial filter W given all the data that we have, given both conditions, so we take the sum of the data covariance matrices, and then we're going to multiply the spatial filter with the individual condition. So first I compute W given all the data, and then I take the data from one condition, and then I multiply it with the common filter W. That gives me the variance for a single source. So that means that I get a variance for, sorry, for a single condition. So that means that in a single condition, I have a variance estimate. In the other condition, I also have a variance estimate. And then I can compare them. Yeah. Doesn't that 
that it was it that uh, it's, a, it's a very good question it, it, it depends on how you ha how you have identified it, the time frequency window so if you at the channel level first make a statistical contrast and a proper statistical contrast at the channel level then you've addressed <coughs> the question is there a significant difference between these conditions and if you've done that correctly then you know that there's a significant difference and then you're only using the beam former to find out where that difference is located in the brain so at that moment at the level of the beam former you don't care about statistics anymore because you have already done your statistical inference at the channel level uh, but that depends on the research question. So, that, so that's why, I if there's a difference in the data, if there's a difference in the brain, we hope there's a difference in the data, and if there's a difference in the data, that difference should be visible on the channel level. Because if, if it's not visible on the channel level, then we have a problem. Well, sometimes it's, it's difficult to find it at the channel level, and it's easy to find it at the source level. So we might not have enough statistical p power to see it at the channel level. And going to the source level, uh, uh, as Caroline explained as well, you can increase the signal-to-noise characteristics of the source. So sometimes when actually we're not doing the statistics at the channel level, we, we do the statistics at the source level. And then you need have to be careful that you do not pick time frequency windows uh, by hand uh, without informing yourself about like, th them being common in both experimental conditions. So it's, it's, more, it's in the procedure where you have to be careful not to build in multiple dependent tests because then you can indeed, indeed inflate the, the false alarm ratio. I'll, I'll, yeah, I, 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 I will return a little bit to, to, to on, on this in the, in the lecture tomorrow. Uh, how much data do you need to make a reliable spatial data system? Do you set the result? It depends a lot on the signals noise characteristics of the data. So what the, we're using the data covariance matrix. Uh, and we, we, we're using the data covariance matrix, well, first of all, to estimate the source of interest, but also to estimate all the interfering sources. Mm -hmm. And w because we want to suppress, we want to actively suppress all the interfering sources. So if you have a lot of signal, then you have a very clear picture of your source of interest. But if you have a very short piece of data, then you might not actually have a very reliable estimate of your noise. And if, if that's the case, then, well, then we can make assumptions on our noise. And there is a parameter which is called lambda. And with lambda, you can make an additional assumption on the, on the noise by regularizing the data covariance matrix. So you add a little bit of artificial noise to the data covariance matrix, which helps if you don't have enough data to get your noise estimated reliably. In the data set that we're going to work with in the Hanson session, actually we have, which is the, um, act the beta band activity in a, in a motor response, actually we have quite a few motor responses because the subject is only pressing a button on the deviance. So I think if I recall correctly we have about 100 deviance out of the 600 stimuli and out of those 100 deviance 50 of them are done with the left hand and 50 are done with the right hand. So that means that we have 50 responses in the data where we have a beta band rebound. And yesterday on the, ch on the channel level we've looked at the beta rebound. It's basically it's a blip in the data, which is about half a second long. So it means that we have 50 times half a second, so that actually we only have 25 seconds of data that we're going to use in the hands-on session to estimate the activity in the one of the motor cortices. So the subject has been sitting in a scanner for, uh, like for, well, for, for an hour or so. 70 minutes was the task. Yeah, and then we're only going to use 2 times 25 seconds. So that's, but, and then you also see that the, in, the, in this experiment that the, the quality of the spatial filters and the quality of the source reconstruction is not so extremely high. It's, it's, it results in quite a blurry picture. But it's, it's, it's difficult to predict how well it works because it's, it, it's about estimating the sources of interest but also about estimating the, the data that has to be suppressed. So sometimes a beamformer works on 10 seconds of data. Um, sometimes you really need, like, multiple minutes or sometimes even like half an hour. Uh, de depends a lot on what you want. <coughs>